Uh, cool. So thanks for joining me here. Today I'm going to be talking about uh, decentralized identity and reputation. So first of all, I'm Sina. Um, I was uh, previously the engineering lead at Truebit, a project for scaling computation on Ethereum. Also helped launch this project called ETHPRIZE, where we interviewed over 100 engineers around the space to pinpoint shared uh, problems around development, you know, like uh, deploying a testnet or doing security audits, and um, helped fund resources towards solving those problems. And uh, more recently, I've been exploring open problems and helping uh, at the Ethereum Foundations with the grants program. So today, I'm going to talk about identity. And I think identity is one of the most important problems any of us could be working on. Um, in the blockchain space, um, identity plays into a whole host of things uh, that we're all excited about. So I'm just going to kind of talk through a few of them. The first is, you know, if you if you're familiar with some of the protocols that are being built, um, you know that Ethereum addresses are pseudonymous. You can create a new one at zero cost, and because of that, a lot of the protocols that exist, like you know Casper. Um, Live peer for you know decentralized video streaming, Truebit for computation. The only way you have of keeping your participants honest is to make them deposit some stake, and then if they do something wrong, burning that stake. And that, by definition, is a one-off game. Um, now imagine if instead of uh, staking ETH or some amount of monetary collateral, people had to stake their reputation and their persistent identity. And if they did something wrong, it was a reputation that would take a hit. This would give us much stronger guarantees around the space. There's a whole host of application layer things that depend on identity. One is governance. Uh, you know, if you want to do any kind of quadratic voting, you need uh, a sense of identity. Uh, On-chain lending relies on identity to be able to underwrite the loans, determine how risky someone is, because you just can't give money to someone who's anonymous and could disappear. Um, airdrops, which are you know, a means of economic distribution and bootstrapping networks. It's one of the very interesting like, crypto-native primitives that we have. Having identity would, would help people do these in a more nuanced way. And um, rate limiting and pricing. So some of the Web2 services that we all use and, and which are great, you know, for example, Dropbox, uh, make extensive use of these techniques. For example, you know, there's freemium models where as a new user you get free access to the service. Uh, or there's tiered uh, usage models where as a pro user you get, uh, you get a discount on, on, on what you're doing. And you just can't replicate these models on the blockchain right now. Uh, and uh, finally, the problem of sampling, which is kind of theoretical, but if you, if you can basically pick uh, an address from amongst a, a number of addresses, and right now you can't do this because they can be sibled, um, this would change everything. This is basically, you know, in some way, it's what proof of work and proof of stake and these various mechanisms are trying to get at, is selecting a leader or sampling a number of people from a large pool. And even in the real world, uh, we're seeing identity become, or digital identity become more and more important. So, the Aadhaar program in India, um, it's an identity system based on biometrics and has over one billion people uh, using it now. And you can use it to sign up for bank accounts, uh, take out loans, uh, e-residency in Estonia, of course, and um, you know, China's rolling out this virtual ID, which um, you know, could speak to alternate ways that we could you know, provide a more self-sovereign way of doing this. So today I'm going to talk about what we mean by identity and reputation, and then talk through uh, some of the nuances through the lens of three particular applications, governance, lending, and security tokens. So an identity is uh, basically you know, the atomic actor within the system. So if we're talking about Ethereum right now, each Ethereum address could be an identity. When you're you know, buying a token on um, 0x or you're uh, you know, staking some ETH uh, in, in a protocol, it, it's that, I, that's the identity. And these addresses can obviously be backed by, by a human being who's controlling the private key, or they could be, back, or they could be a smart contract that has uh, interesting mechanisms around um, you know, different, uh, different uh, spending limits, access control mechanisms. And 
if you, know, you, you build up a history as you engage with the network through your identity, and this speaks to the importance of being, this identity being secure, and why if you have a multi-sig and you have ways to recover your keys, um, um, is, it's important. And obviously it plays into the user experience, which a lot of other people are talking about at this conference. The next kind of uh, part of this that, that uh, you should know about is that this idea of a claim, which is you, know, you have all these identities dispersed around the network, and each one of them can claim something about another one. So you can, you can you know, identity A can say that identity B has passed KYC, or that they're you know, a resident of this country, or they, they have this income. And these could play different, uh, it's just kind of a primitive that you can use within different applications. And you don't really need to enforce any kind of authority here. Any, you know, any, I can claim something about someone else, they can claim something about someone else. And there's a lot of awesome teams working on pushing this stuff forward. Projects like Zeppelin TPL, Bloom, Uport, ERC 725, and 735. And there's different architectures, you know, like storing these claims in a, in a smart contract registry, storing them with the user in a more self-sovereign way. Um, and this is kind of an area of active experimentation. And what do we mean by reputation? Reputation is, you know, when, you, when one of these identities kind of builds up trust over time. So it goes from this state of being just this anonymous, you know, Ethereum address to, to an identity that people can trust. And you can think of this analogously to the real world. So think of you, you know, just hearing of a, an engineer for the first time who you've never met before, you don't know anything about them, how do you know if they're any good or if you should you know, work with them? This can happen in one of two ways, really. Either someone you already trust goes on, out on the limb and is like, no, this person's amazing, like, um, and, and through, that, through their you know, trust, you, you take a chance on this person. Or that... Um, that graph of trust isn't there, and instead this person just shows up and does some good work over time. And through their own good behavior, they build up their reputation. So we can use the same two kinds of ideas on blockchains. So let's talk about governance a little bit. Governance is uh, really important in this space, you know, as it comes to decentralized networks upgrading without you know, a central party making that choice, when it comes to allocating funds, um, and uh, making decisions as a whole. And we can't really replicate the model that exists in the real world, which is one person, one vote, because obviously you, know, you can spin up multiple addresses and sibyl the system. And so what's been happening so far is coin voting, which is you, know, you have this scarce resource, which, which is the number of tokens you have, uh, or the number of uh, the amount of ETH you have, and you stake this uh, ETH, and it your voice in this um, vote is determined by how much you staked. And this this works, um, but you know it has this problem of being plutocratic, which is people with more money get more voice in the system. So this all speaks to this need for decentralized civil resistant identity. Civil resistant meaning. You can't, uh, you can't, you know, one person can't spin up multiple identities. And it's decentralized, meaning it emerges from the network. And this is, this is one of the hardest problems that exists in this space. And I think anyone who wants to work on an e interesting research problem should go and attack this. And I'll just talk through kind of a thought experiment of how, how you can think about this. One, one method of approaching this, though no system has been built that fully achieves this. So I think that there's some protocol, let's say you know, one of my favorites, 0x, uh, wants to upgrade their contracts. This is you know, couple, like some time in the future, and the system is fully decentralized. And they want the network to vote on whether you know, this change happens or how it happens. And one, one way you could do this, instead of doing the coin voting, is you could just announce that any Ethereum address who wants to have an input on this, we're just going to airdrop 100 you know, vote tokens onto them. And so you just uh, give this to everyone on the network. And obviously you can't just like, get these people to vote with these tokens because it would be civiled. But what happens instead is there's a campaigning period where anyone can you know, use the existing social channels to campaign for their voice to be heard. So you know, the core Zero X team, people in the community, developers, anonymous, you know, Reddit commenters, everyone would make their case for why, why they should uh, have an input into this. 
and you know, they would list their Ethereum address next to their name. And during this month of campaigning, you go and allocate your vote tokens between all these other people in whatever proportions that you want. And now, once the month is over, you take the vote. So everyone just casts their vote once. But instead of um, counting each vote as equal, or equal to the number of tokens they had, instead, you know, the naive way would be how many vote tokens did they get allocated to them by the community, which would already be pretty interesting. But what you could do is actually run PageRank on this, which is you know, Google's algorithm for ranking websites. So you would say, you know, this person, you know, person X received all these vote tokens to them, so their, their voice obviously matters, and you can imagine, you know, Will and Amir from 0x receiving all these vote tokens. But then you wouldn't stop there, you would iterate the, the algorithm again, and you'd be like, who have these people allocated their, their limited 100 vote tokens? And those uh, edges themselves have more value. And this wasn't determined by you know, any centralized process, it's just a property of the network. People, someone gets a, a lot of votes from the community, and because of that, their own votes become more important. And then, um, you know, in turn, that person's votes become more important. So this, this process converges, and is, is a really interesting idea. The problem is that, you know, this approach also can be sibled. So you can, you know, if you have the real trust graph here of all these people, um, you know, allocating their tokens within the real uh, Ethereum ecosystem, someone could just spin up a thousand addresses and replicate the exact same structure on this side. And this is why this is an open problem. So some ideas there are having globally trusted peers, you know, maybe like 10, 50, or 100 addresses that kind of everyone agrees should be trusted. And you kind of start the graph from them, and you're like, who do these people trust, who do they trust? And this has a way of like bringing the network, to grounding the network. Another approach is to re requiring a scarce resource to create an edge. So you know, you could use those 0x tokens to to create these edges, and that makes them, means that one person just can't create an infinite number of them. And the final one is you could, you could pattern match from the top down. So you could say that, um, you know, these addresses seem to be trusting themselves within this cluster, but no one from the outside is trusting them. And the next problem is how do you actually incentivize these, uh, these people to allocate these tokens correctly? So what's what makes you spend the time and the due diligence to find out who to give your tokens to? And what prevents you from giving this to just you know, bad actors in the system? And you know, there's ideas around using collateral and requiring people you know, lock up some value that they get back in time, or um, if these edges actually come to existence as a byproduct of existing behavior. So a great example of this is in the web itself, where you know, Google didn't go to all these people and tell them to point to each other so that the page rank algorithm could work. Instead, someone who's building a website personally just wants to have good links going out because that means that their website is more interesting and they get more traffic and, you know, they're just doing that in a selfish way. And, um, and that, in turn, means that this page rank can be built on top of it. So um, there's projects exploring this in crypto as well, like SourceGrad, which is doing it for GitHub. So this, um, you know, this is a really interesting area to explore, and you should all kind of look into it. Next kind of application we'll look at is lending. So lending, you know, intuitively makes sense as a place where we all should look for applying this blockchain technology. You know, it's a global network. You can write code instead of legal contracts. It's self-enforcing. Um, but then again, there's a problem. You can't just extend the line of credit to an anonymous person because um, they can disappear. They can take that money and run. And so there's a few ideas. I'll kind of talk through a spectrum of them here. And my goal is to show that the identity systems that we build are nuanced and, and relate to what we're trying to achieve on the application layer. So, there's existing companies in the Web2 world that give out loans to people without credit scores. And, you know, they begin by lending really small amounts. So, you know, let's say it's a village in sub-Saharan Africa. They start by lending out $5 a, a month or till the loan is paid back. And then as this person builds up reputation, they increase that amount. 
And uh, this has actually worked. You know, these are successful companies um, actually like making a difference in the world. But the critical thing is that they all rely on this person's real world identity. So they, they you know, read their, use the person's contact list and GPS location and if they have identity information. And they use these things to underwrite that person's risk and know that in the future if this person, um, you know, exits the system that they don't let them in again. So this is how these systems have been able to build up uh, trust over time. And that's not really available to us in the crypto space if we want to build fully anonymous, you know, decentralized lending systems. And the example of this kind of was shown in, in you know, earlier when um, this awesome company, BTC Jam, which was doing Bitcoin lending in the developing world, um, you know, a lot of people were very excited about it, but there was just a lot of exit scams. So people would build up their reputation by borrowing, paying back in time, not defaulting, and as soon as this value would get large enough, they would just run away with the money, and then they'd start over again. So how do you solve that? Another idea is, okay, let's not do this decentralized anonymous thing. Let's do peer-to-peer -peer loans in a user's own community. So in their own village, people trust them socially, so, so you can do that. And you know, that wasn't possible before either. We can use blockchain technology to enable that. There's a few questions there, again, more on the social layer rather than on the te 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 technology layer which is, you know, do their, does their community actually have the capital to lend? Like, is that a, a believable idea? And the other one is, do people like to borrow or lend from people they know? You know, if you think about it right now, would you take out, you know, a loan from your friends? Uh, or would you lend to your friends? And how would that impact your personal relationship? So some people, you know, there's some research that shows people actually behave better if you do that. Um, because of the social accountability, and there's, there's a bunch of people who think that you know, people would rather have this relationship with some bank and not involve their, you know, have the separation between the personal and the financial life. So again, things that we need to all think about. And you know, the, 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 you know, the, on the other side of a continuum is, okay, it's, it's actually n not using the blockchain for peer-to-peer, -peer, you know, lending um, for you know, building up reputation. We're just using the blockchain to simplify the payment rails and make it global and automate you know, the settlement. And you know, the case here is that even the peer-to-peer -peer lending marketplaces like Lending Club and Prosper and these companies that have been built over the last 10 years, even though they're peer-to-peer, -peer, most of the volume comes from institutional investors. And the, the catch is that if you talk to these institutions, they actually can't go off of peer-to-peer -peer claims. Like, they, they don't, they, it's not good enough if, you know, 10 Ethereum addresses or your friends in the community say that you have this income. They actually need to know that. And, you know, when it comes to KYC and AML, they actually need certified authorities to do that. So, so you know, again, it's like you, you, you need to think about how, what the application is as you design the identity reputation layer. The final thing I wanted to talk about is security tokens, which have been getting a lot of you know, attention recently, and um, the case makes sense, you know, so the idea is that there's all these real world illiquid assets like real estate, art, private company equity, and you can tokenize them, you can open them to global markets, um, you know, people can, um, people can own fractional amounts, and, and uh, you know, it seems like a value add. And maybe this would open up ownership to, you know, people who, who aren't in the U.S. You know, someone could own a piece of an American company uh, even if they live in Asia or in Africa. So we actually, like, looked into this because we're, we were kind of researching identity broadly. And it turns out that um, if these issuers are in regulated um, countries themselves, and because this is, like, in the name is a security token, the compliance means that they're actually on the hook for who buys these tokens. So they need to you know, run all the traditional processes that they would have to in the real world uh, on the buyers. So you know, KYC, AML, accreditation, OFAC lists, debarment lists. And 
And that's fair enough. Um, and you know, then you think about what you could really change on the identity layer, and you realize that, again, peer-to-peer -peer identities don't work, because this issuer is actually legally on the hook. Like, they will go to jail if, they, if the government realizes that someone didn't have the KYC AML. So they need to rely on certified authorities to do that. And another kind of nuance, again, that emerges is, so you could, you know, you, you say that, um, you know, let's put, uh, let's put the KYC AML uh, self-sovereign, the user hosts them, and this is what, you know, an awesome company like Bloom is doing right now. So it's, the attestations come from regulated authorities, but the user actually holds them, they reveal them when they want. Um, but there's other things you need to navigate here. So the, these providers, the, K, the at attesters, actually their incentives are, right now, you know, if a user is going to buy five different tokens, um, each of those platforms um, does the KYC wants, and this like, provider like, makes money from that. So by putting this stuff on chain, you're actually like, lowering um, the redundancy. So there's a lot of kind of case-by-case -case nuances that you need to navigate. And so, just wanted to kind of give some context, um, you know, beyond the key management and the user experience and these things, which are all really important, and um, we need to work on to make this stuff viable for people who aren't, you know, who aren't in the space, like, so they can actually use this stuff. But um, we need to actually think about um, what use cases we're building for and design with, with that in mind from the architecture layer. And uh, that's what I'll leave you with. Thanks. Yeah. We, we do have about four minutes. Do anyone have, wants to ask a question? OK, down there. Hello, uh, Dmitry Bispalov, Gnosis Safe. Uh, let's imagine that you have solved most of the problems that you, you were talking about. Uh, in, this, in this case, what would be the major problems for the adoption of the decentralized identity? Decentralized meaning it's not pegged on the real world, it emerges from the network? Um, maybe in this case, like, um, maybe it depends on the problems that you were talking about, but in a sense, what would be the adoption barriers for, uh, yeah. for, for this kind of thing? Uh, so the question is, what would be the adoption barriers to an identity system? And I think there's, um, you know, you, there's multiple aspects to this. One part of it is, you just need to have like a very compelling use case where people are coming in and using, you know, because this technology still it's it's hard to use. And um, one thing you notice is that identity in the Web two world has always emerged as a byproduct of an application that people actually want to use. So there's been attempts to build more self-sovereign identity on Web2 you know, from 10, 15 years ago. But eventually what became people's identity was their email address because they were just using it to communicate with everyone. Or it was their Facebook login because you know, everyone had it and people had originally joined to build relationships and stay in touch. So I think a key part is actually having use cases that pull people in. And then beyond that, it's um, you know, security. So you know, having um, you know, there's a lot of good ideas around having different keys with different levels of permissions, different key recovery mechanisms, because you just can't you can't you know lose your identity, and most people aren't gonna aren't gonna like have the level of understanding of the technologies, like be able to do that stuff hands on, and the user experience. So you know, um, even having to understand. Um, you know, claims or transactions or d delegation or all these things need to get abstracted over time, which I think I'm hopeful will happen given how many great people are working on in this space. But it's all stuff we need to figure out. Thank you. Hi. Whoops. <laughs> Hi. Um, we're working in the self-sovereign identity space, and I uh, would be curious uh, what's your opinion about the major challenges to get the, the current understanding of self-sovereign identity, either uh, the approach of Uport or Sovereign or 
whoever, where do you see the major challenges to get it on a, on a broader level uh, towards the people? Uh, so or the question, even, even here in the room. So basically take, take that crowd and not just the ordinary person, if, yeah. you, if you like. I think this speaks to why it's important to think of the design consciously up front. So, you know, if you let it purely emerge as a byproduct of the application, then you don't really know what's going to happen. It, you know, all these claims might be on chain and like it might be, you know, might completely lack privacy or, you know, some, the, the, the dominant service that's getting all the traction might just store all the information in a centralized server. So it's good that we're thinking about it up front. Um, I think, um, I mean, I've seen some approaches that are pretty interesting. Like, again, talking to the Bloom team while you're here would be, like, they have a pretty interesting go-to-market strategy. Um, but yeah, I think it's use cases, user experience, security, these kind of things. That's, you know, have you